Happy Sunday, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I am Jeremy Birmingham. That is Andrew Ellis. This is Talking Stuff. We, because we are entering into the spring football uh, portion of the Buckeyes football schedule, are going to be trying to shift Talking Stuff for at least the next eight weeks to Sunday in order to, A, uh, get through the week where there's a lot of visitors happening and a lot of different things, uh, moving parts as far as recruiting goes, uh, and B, because I tr- will be back and forth a lot between my home and Columbus uh, during the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that sort of stuff. Sunday, generally, I think I'll be home, which gives us an opportunity to sit down and talk some stuff. So, Andrew, we're going to talk stuff right now. It's Sunday. It's March the 3rd. Uh, the March 4th, which is tomorrow, Monday, begins the new a quiet period and a quiet period in the recruiting calendar means that recruits can visit campus. That means that they can come to schools and see schools in person. And a lot of players will begin doing that this week for Ohio state starting on Monday. Um, will probably be a much quieter day. Tuesday, first day of practice is when you'll really start to see it. And then Thursday for practice will be another big day for Ohio state this week. It's mostly going to be about in-state kids who are going to be able to come down uh, or come up to Columbus, and, and and it'll be a lot of tours. It'll be big groups of local kids. And then as the month goes along, as the weather starts to get more consistent and reliable, as we head closer to the spring football game on April the 13th, we'll start to see more and bigger names uh, start to come into town for Ohio State as that occurs. But what we're going to do now first is talk about a guy that I'm fully expecting to visit this month. He announced his top six schools on Saturday. And it's a player that I think people are going to be like, oh, here we go again. Uh, And that is uh, fair, I suppose. It's a fair response to David Sanders, the number one ranked offensive tackle in the country, the number one ranked offensive lineman in the country, five-star, all-world, everything tackle. I think he was the only um, junior on the Max Preps All-American team this past year. Um, Has six schools left, and Ohio State is one of them. The group is interesting in a number of ways because schools that people I think expected to be on there, like Michigan, for example, are not. Um, And Ohio State is the lone team above the Mason-Dixon line that's made the cut for David Sanders. He's only been to campus one time. That was for the spring game a year ago. Uh, The Buckeyes have stayed like, they're like alligators, you know, like where your eyeballs are just above the surface. And they're like, well, I a normal creature would drown right but ohio state's not a normal creature they're an alligator you like that uh yeah i like that um i like crocodiles better than alligators but but i i get the analogy yeah yeah because of um, any snouts yeah yeah i get it that's a good point uh i don't know man like i'm the, seeing ohio state in the top six is good obviously you look through the rest of the top six and you got schools like georgia on there clemson um it, it's not going to be easy uh, and it really, it never is when you're dealing with schools like that. And when you're dealing with five-star offensive tackles, of course, I think if there's really one guy, if you went down through the national rankings, like one name you could pluck to add to that 2025 recruiting class, that's the one you're going with. Um, I think fans like myself have been kind of, uh, hurt in the past, sometimes getting our hopes up a little bit on guys like Samson Okanola and, and just names like that over the last few years. So making the top six is good. Getting him on campus is a good thing. If you read the, um, I believe it was from Adam Gorney, the update on his top six schools, the the first thing he said about Ohio State was how far from home it is. Yeah. So that doesn't give you the warm and fuzzies, but it, hey, it's cool to be in it, I guess. Yeah, that is the hard part. Uh, it, it's interesting. You know, it was a year ago, as I said, when David Sanders was on campus for the first time. He's from Charlotte, North Carolina. So let's not act like he's living in Juneau, Alaska or something like that, first and foremost. Uh, but it is further away than the rest of the schools on his list. It's Alabama, it's Tennessee, it's Georgia, it's Clemson, it's South Carolina, uh, and, and it's Ohio State. And so the Buckeyes clearly are the one that's furthest away. They are the place he's been the least. They are the relationship that, if you asked him, is probably um, the the one that has to go the furthest. But it is interesting, again, just to note that Ohio State got put on this list. I fully expect he will visit this month. The date that I've heard uh, bandered about is the uh, March 22nd. That weekend, I know that Devin Sanchez will be in town, so that's at least an opportunity for Ohio State to have 
one of their most active recruiters, but not just the recruiter himself and Devin Sanchez, but their family in town to help recruit David Sanders and his family. And if you go back a year ago to the spring game, the one thing that David Sanders really like said stood out to him was the time he spent with Paris Johnson. And so the opportunity for Paris's mom, Monica, and, and David's mom was was really important, and it did a great thing for Ohio State in getting the Buckeyes into this conversation where they really weren't a year ago. And I think people, you know, we talked about it earlier this week. You and I were texting about it, but like, I think there's an assumption that, like Jordan Davison, for example, the running back from California, that because people don't talk about Ohio State in his recruitment on a national level that the Buckeyes aren't involved and, and they are doing everything they can to be involved at this. They're not, they don't get a lot of the hype that I think some of these other schools get, which I'm not entirely sure why, because they are the freaking alligators, but like uh, David Sanders choosing to put Ohio state in this top six over other schools like Michigan, for example, that's what I keep going to be. That's Jaden Davis's high school, for example, uh, is one of the reasons why, um, like, I think that matters. And I think you have to at least be somewhat optimistic about it because they will probably get him on campus in March. They will get him in campus or on campus in June for an official visit. So you have an opportunity here. And if you look at the depth chart, if you look at what Ohio State is now um, doing from an NIL standpoint, that will play a large factor in this recruitment as well. Like, I, I, I don't think you can just dismiss them out of hand because he says the distance plays a large factor, but uh, distance does matter. There are still things that, like old school things that matter in recruiting still do matter. And, and that's one of them. But the fact that he put them in this list and he's going to visit in three weeks, going to visit in June, I think you at least have to have a, you can understand having a little bit of optimism, right? Yeah. Um, maybe a smidge, uh, again, just getting him on campus is big. Having him around, uh, Devin Sanchez and his family is big. That, that kid's a hell of a recruiter and his, you know, his whole family is, but I guess from what you've heard, how would you kind of handicap the race right now? Like I know on his rivals, he, he has one future cast pick in and that's from, I think August for Georgia. I've read a lot about Clemson lately. Do you kind of have a feel for the pecking order right now or not? I mean, he said in the interview that he did with Adam Gorney from rivals that it's fair to say that t Tennessee Clemson and Georgia are like somewhat at the top of his list. But again, that I think is based on the fact that he's been to those places a lot. He's obviously has good relationships with them with Georgia. You can't discount the fact that, you know, they, they've won two of his last three national championships. Um, but I would say Ohio State is probably running sixth. But I, again, I don't know that that's a, I don't know that that's something where you should automatically discount it and say, well, there's no way they can win this fight. I'm surprised more that Alabama's included on this list than I am Ohio State based on the fact that they have all of these changes that they've made uh, with their program in the last uh, six weeks. So kudos to Kalen DeBoer for staying involved here. But uh, yeah, I mean, would the Buckeyes be the favorite right now? Certainly not. But does it does it mean that you shouldn't have any optimism? I would say that's not true either. Uh, but it, it it's not like one of these situations where you walk into it and you say, oh, you know, like Jamie French, for example, where, you know, we talked last week about Jamie, Jamie French on Talking Stuff, where like, I don't know if he's going to end up at Ohio State. I think it's pretty clear that right now the Buckeyes are at the top of his list, and I think the Buckeyes, if if he had to choose today, would pick Ohio State. But does that he doesn't have to choose today. If David Sanders had to choose today, I don't think he'd pick Ohio State, but he doesn't have to choose today. So you at least have an opportunity to to do some work there. What you get, provided he visits on March 22nd weekend like we're expecting, you get a weekend where Tavian St. Clair is there with him. You get a weekend where Carter Lowe will be there. You get a weekend where Devin Sanchez is going to be there. And all of a sudden, you start to put these guys around. Like, here's five-star, five-star, five-star. And all of a sudden, that distance to home, which, again, is an hour and 15-minute flight from Charlotte to Columbus, becomes a much different thing, especially when you're dealing with a high school student that because of the NIL situation happening between the NCAA and courts and injunctions, like there's ways to get people on campus now that there just weren't before. And I, I think that you can find a way to mitigate that distance from home. Uh, I'm not talking like Derek Morris uh, for the old, for the old recruiting heads in the, in the chat. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about that type of fine ways to get things done, but um, nobody needs to get his dad a job or anything in Columbus, but like there there's ways to do this now where you couldn't do it that way before. And I, I think it's, it is worth saying, 
in a world where Ohio State's going to need three solid offensive tackles in this class, and you already have Carter Lowe, you have you have as good a fighter's chance as anybody in this in this battle. I really think it because, and it's less and less important than it has been in years past. And I know you specifically hate it when I say this type of stuff. But David Sanders is an Ohio State kid, uh, and that is. I don't know how much that really matters anymore. I don't know the value of that as much as it was three, four years ago prior to NIL, but like he is an Ohio state type of kid and the relationship he has with Paris Johnson matters. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you on that. And and I mentioned Samson Okanola earlier and entirely different situations. I want to make that clear, but yeah, if you could get him and, and Carter Lowe in the same class, I mean, that's like a dream hall at offensive tackle and then, you know, find another guy for number three. But I mean, Carter Lowe is now a five star in the updated rivals rankings. And uh, we'll see if Mr. Sanders heads to town sometime this month, I guess. Yeah, let me, let me just read this quote from him. Knowing that I'm a kid from down south with all these big SEC and ACC schools down here, right in my backyard, pretty much, they've done an amazing job. Like that, that's, he doesn't have to say that, you know, and for a guy that, for a program that hasn't really been talked about much in this recruitment, the fact that he's putting the Buckeyes in that conversation. I I just don't think you should wipe it away uh, offhand. You know, on Friday he had announced that he was going to release his top six schools, and I tweeted, you know, quote tweeted it saying, you know, pretty big, pretty big news there for people. And I had a couple different commenters and and DMs saying, well, Ohio State's not even going to be involved here. But I'm like, I, I think they're going to be in this top six. Uh, but yeah, they got work to do. But you get the shot to do the work, and that's what's important. You have two visits at least coming up, and then you you take your swings. Final thoughts on David Sanders? Uh, you know, anything else about him that you're like, well, shove it, shove it, Jeremy. No, I mean, you just got to take your swing. And until he, until he commits to a different, to some, whatever school, you're going to have comments like those, like those ones you received uh, on, on Twitter about Ohio state, not really being in it, but Hey, they made, they made the first cut and uh, now they're going to get him on campus. So shoot your shot. Yeah. And, and the thing is because you have Carter Lowe in this class, it, it, it does feel a little bit like, gravy if you can make it happen but like i I think the buckeyes i'm not going to say they are in a in a sneaky position here or anything but i think they can can win this fight you just have to get them on campus on march 22nd or sometime this month um and, and go from there he's one of those guys that you absolutely have to get on campus there are a number of players who are coming to columbus as we mentioned over the next um you know couple of of weeks and over the next six weeks or so I wrote about it at Rivals.com earlier this week. I, I listed five players that I thought were the most important spring visitors for Ohio State. All of these guys are either confirmed visitors or like they have told the coaching staff that they plan on visiting at certain dates. David Sanders is one. Jamie French, five-star, in my mind, four-star on Rivals.com, but I think he's a five-star across some of the other uh, networks. Five-star type wide receiver from Florida who is visiting March 30th. He'll be there. So that's the same weekend that Jordan Davison is going to be there, who is on this list. That is the same weekend that Fahim Delane is going to be there, who is on this list. That is going to be, I believe, Ohio State's Student Appreciation Weekend, which is when they open up practice to the student body. And it is a great weekend for the Buckeyes when it comes to recruiting because these kids get to see a really cool atmosphere. Um, And then the final guy on that list is Nate Roberts, who is visiting for the spring game. And some of those guys are players that I think Ohio State needs to move the dial for. Some of them are guys that I think Ohio State is going to be spending that time with them on this upcoming spring visit, trying to expedite their process and maybe push them a little bit to say, you know what, Fahim, do do you really need to go visit Colorado and Texas two weeks after this? Do you really need to wait until may like you really need to like and i think that's uh, nate roberts do you how many times do you have to be here to see this to know that this is where you want to be etc and then there's the other guys like jordan davis and who i think people as we just discussed like don't really consider ohio state as a true fighter in the in the recruitment but i don't know why they don't as we talked about all last week on, on talking stuff but are there any guys in your mind and and there were a lot of players I could have put on this list. One of them I know that you're interested in is Marquise, uh, Marquise Davis, the running back from Cleveland Heights. But are there any other players that you are like, you? what about this guy? How come he's not on this list? 
Um, I mean, you honestly hit on the big ones like Delane and uh, Davison are were two of the were two of the names that I had on my list along with Roberts. And we talked about it last week, just how Oregon and Ohio State are kind of going at it for a lot of these guys. All three of those guys, Oregon's very much involved for. Um, those are kind of the ones that I had highlighted. I, you know, Marquise Davis, I think, is right up there. If if Jordan Davison's one A, um, Marquise or Marquise Davis probably one B. So those are kind of the ones that I've got on my on my radar right now. Um, and I know there's going to be more names added over the next coming weeks that we're not even talking about right now, probably, to be honest. Yeah, I think it's important to make sure people understand that running back right now, I, I believe that the only two players, and this, I could be wrong, I, I'm, I don't know this, I haven't been told this, but it's just the way I'm reading things. I think the only two players anywhere right now that are, are like surefire, Ohio State would say yes today to, would be Jordan Davis and Marquise Davis. Um, and I, I think that that's an important distinction to be made at running back where it's a class that, as we talked about last week, they're probably going to need two in this class. Um, I think those are the only two they would say yet. Yeah. Like if they called today, Sunday afternoon, and said, hey, man, I want in. I think I don't know that there's anyone else that they would automatically be like, okay, you, you got your spot. Um, and that's pretty important. I, I really did think about putting Marquise Davis on this list for that for that reason. Um, and because of the fact that it seems like his other top school would be Michigan, uh, which I think is always disturbing for people in the state of Ohio, considering that Jordan Marshall picked Michigan over Ohio state a year ago. Um, I think that's worth, you know, a concern. Um, there are other players on this list that like Khalid Lockett, the wide receiver from Texas, who I think um, should maybe could have been on this list ahead of Jamie French. I think there's a small group at wide receiver that are in the same boat. Like these are the top tier guys, and Jamie French is one of them. Um, Khalid Lockett is one of them. So I think I could have picked him because he's never been to Ohio State, and it would be his first trip as opposed to I think this would be Jamie French's fourth. So that's – but I think from a perception standpoint, like going back into Florida, taking the number one receiver again from the state of Florida, taking guys away from – Miami and Florida State, like I think that's more important than pulling a guy from Texas, which which is why I ended up putting um, Jamie French on the list instead of uh, Kali Clockett. Right, and kind of I mean we've talked about names that have obviously already been offered, but uh, Damian Shanklin, you know that kid that Notre Dame is after. Where's is he from? Illinois, is that right, Shanklin? He's from Indiana. He's from Indiana. Indiana. He's, he's visiting this week, so he's like kind of the biggest out of state visitor that I know is coming on thursday so he he's one of those those big ones he is going to get offered this week i'm pretty confident um and they need to get that offer out to him to really put themselves in the position to to win that fight that's michigan notre dame etc um uh, lsu offered recently like he's going to have he's going to be a big big name to watch nationally so it would be a pretty big shock if he's not offered here in the next five days then uh, yeah, he's. I mean, he visits on Thursday, so I would expect that to be announced by Thursday at seven o'clock. Um, you know, another guy like London Merritt is another guy that could have been on this list of 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 most important visitors heading to town in spring. But I was trying to narrow it down to five or six guys and not thirty, so that that's the reason why. But um, it, it, as you look ahead here, I mean, obviously. I don't I don't have a schedule yet for Naeem Offord when he's getting back in town. He was just on campus a month ago, so I don't know if he'll be back um, for the spring game maybe. Devin Sanchez, as I said, will be there on March 22nd, but also come back for the spring game. So he'll be there with Nate Roberts and Tavian St. Clair will obviously be there for that. Um, you know, as Tavian said when he was on the show a week ago, like he he's been telling other recruits, like, you tell me when you're gonna be there and I'll be there. So I expect to see him frequently um it is it a disappointment if any of these guys uh, if none of these guys commit so these five guys that i listed and obviously we're not expecting david sanders to commit to ohio state anytime soon jamie french has said he's going to wait as long as he can in this process fahim delane nate roberts jordan davison let's let's talk about those three specifically if none of those three commit by the end of spring is it a disappointment? Does it feel like a letdown or is it like these are your top players at incredibly important positions? So you just keep plugging away and you realize 
that when you're playing the game for top five talents, like this is how it is now. Um, yeah, I don't think you can be disappointed if, if, I mean, there's a really good chance that none of these guys commit here in the next couple of months. I think Jamie French has already talked about, I don't know about going the distance, but at least taking his recruitment into the summer, I believe. So I, I don't think you can be disappointed in that. Um, uh, we didn't, we haven't talked much about TJ Alford. I know he's visiting later this month, right before his decision. So that's probably of all the names that are, whether it was in your article or just all the big names in general that are in line to visit this month. I think as of right now, that's really the only one that we're expecting to, um, that we're actually expecting a decision here in the next handful of weeks, unless I'm forgetting somebody. No, he's the only one that's announced that he's got a decision date. That's March 30th. He'll visit March 23rd weekend as well. So like that, you can add another name to that David Sanders, De Devin Sanchez type of, of weekend where you're like, this is a big one. Um, and that'll be like a scrimmage weekend for Ohio State. So that'll be a, an important trip. And TJ Alford, again, is another guy that could have been on this list, but just isn't because I, did, I didn't want to go 7,000 deep. Um, you know, Elijah Barnes, another Texas linebacker. Uh, DJ uh, Petaway, the Dijon Petaway. Is it Dijon Petaway, the linebacker? Dijon Petaway from Texas. Like he's expected to be, like all those guys are equally important. Um, but because Alfred is going to commit on March 30th, like I would put him on the pecking order. Uh, priority one for Ohio state at linebacker. So um, as we turn away from like those big names of visitors and look into local kids that are visiting, there is one to watch this week. As I said about Damian Shanklin from Indianapolis, I'm pretty confident he'll get offered on Thursday. Um, Nolan Davenport from Maslin Washington high school uh, is also visiting on Thursday. And I, I think he's also going to get an offer this week, and that's going to be a game changer for for Nolan Davenport. So if you're talking about a potential, like here's a unexpected spring commitment type, maybe Nolan Davenport for Maslin Washington, a six foot six, two hundred and sixty five pound offensive tackle prospect, fits that bill. He's much more developmental than Carter Lowe or um, David Sanders. Obviously, he's only been playing tackle for one season. But the leap that he made uh, from freshman to sophomore year as an off as a tight end to now, his athleticism is is really really high. Uh, he's got a lot of big offers. The Penn States of the world who are pushing very hard and trying to drive that wedge that schools do early in the process when Ohio State has an offer and say, "Oh, you, they don't want you. They're never going to offer you. You're Plan B for them. You're a fallback." Um, like that's not true. First and foremost, and it's important for Ohio State to make sure that Nolan Davenport recognizes that heading into uh, the spring because he's going to have a lot of trips that he's going to make. But the first one is going to be to Columbus. He's, I, I, I feel like he's going to get an offer on Thursday um, as the Buckeyes look to shore up. You know, they've had this philosophy in the last few years, Andrew, like if, some, if you're going to offer a kid in November, maybe you need to offer him in May or March or whatever month we're in. That backfired a year ago with Mark Nave from Toledo Central Catholic. Do you think that that approach is smart or do you think that that is folly when you're Ohio state and you can flip pretty much anyone in November? I, I hope that they offer Davenport this week. And I admittedly have never watched his highlight tape. None of that stuff at all. Not that offensive linemen highlight tapes are particularly exciting unless you're Bill Landis, but six foot six tackles, athletic kids from inside the state of Ohio. They're not going to scare off a kid like David Sanders or someone of that caliber. And I would just hate to see them kind of dilly dally around on this while teams like Penn State, Michigan State, those those schools kind of maybe prioritize him a bit more. So if I'm Ohio State, if they think he can play, whether it's two years from now or four years from now, I would offer them this week. I've, I've just seen it so many times in the past where, again, like a Michigan State or a Kentucky has come in and offered some of these guys who turned out to be good players. And then Ohio State tried late and didn't get them. So I would I would try to get on get in on this one early if I were Justin Fry, but that's just me, a guy who's never watched his highlight tape or anything and just looked at the measurables. Yeah, I mean Notre Dame is offered, Penn State is offered, so this is a different conversation even than the Kentucky and Michigan State conversation that that we could have for about a lot of kids. Like there are top twelve programs in the country that have offered Nolan Davenport. And knowing again that he's only played one year of offensive tackle, like the ceiling is very high, but you're talking four years from now until you get that. But you don't want to have to try to get a kid on the rebound or try to get a kid out of the transfer portal because if he ends up at Notre Dame or Penn State or a place like that, 
the odds of that happening are low. So, um, I, I don't really view it in a similar light to the Mark Nave situation. I mean, they offered Nave early. They took a commitment from him early and the A ended up parted ways and he's, he signed with Kentucky. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, he's going to go on and play college football and be under scholarship and all that stuff, just like everybody else. So if that, if that happens, it's, it's not the end of the world. So go after him early. That's my opinion. Yeah. I mean, if, if they don't do what you need him to do, if they don't develop the way you think they will heading into the summer and into their senior season, then as long as you're honest with kids and coaches, you can find a way to move on uh, and, and, and part as friends. And that is what happened in the Nave situation. Um, and obviously then they replaced him with Gabe Van Sickle and, and, and you have a different type of developmental prospect, but that's what you have. One guy who's not developmental, and I think it's worth talking about, um, as the, the chatter has begun to perk up over the last like seven or eight days or so is LSU five-star commitment to Corey and Moore from Duncanville high school in Texas. Um, about a year ago, like there was some chatter about him in Ohio State. And at the time, like there was just not any connection that got made between the Buckeyes and DeCorey and Moore committed to LSU very early. In the last couple of weeks, the discussion from Columbus about DeCorey and Moore has ramped up. And people that I talked to in the state of Texas have also indicated that maybe he's willing or interested in, in opening up his recruitment at least partially and, and taking a look at the Ohio States of the world, the Texases of the world, and seeing if the grass is a little greener on those sides. I'm not saying he's like all out on LSU or he decided that he doesn't want to go there, um, but I do think that there's an opportunity for Ohio State to, to make a little bit of motion in this battle, which I think would be a shock. I watched Corey and Moore play uh, in person against Evan Sanchez in North Shore High School in December. And I'm telling you, the kid was sensational, like sensational. Um, definitely not like the big type of wide receiver that Ohio State has been using the last few years. He's probably 5'11", maybe six foot tall, but he is a freaky speed burner. And, you know, there was, like I said, not a great connection between Brian Hartline and DeCorian Moore a year ago. But that seems to be changing recently. And, you know, I was told before that DeCorian had gone, was pretty just quiet and seemed disinterested in Ohio State, and that that's not the case at this point. So that's interesting. Yeah, that's really not a name that I had thought much about up until this past week or so when you kind of mentioned him to me in passing. But, um, I mean, it's Brian Hartline. So should anybody really be surprised that? I guess a month ago, Ohio State's wide receiver board, there were some questions about what's 2025 going to end up looking like there. And now we're talking about Ohio State with Jamie French, who I believe is the number four receiver in the country. And now with the Corey Moore, who is the number one wide receiver in the country. And I believe the number four player overall. Um, if he opens up that recruitment, that'll be interesting. And if he makes it to town sometime here in the next couple of months, that'd be great. I don't think he's on like the tentative list for March or anything at this point. Is that correct? Yeah, not not to my knowledge, not yet. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it, it's Brian Hartline, so nothing will surprise me at this point. And I'm sure the rest of the fan base feels the same way. Yeah. I, I would fully expect Ohio state to land four of the top 20 receivers in the country again this year. I mean, that's just become the standard. Uh, you have a commitment from Javen Boggs who is not nearly get the conversation that he deserves nationally. I don't entirely know what people are waiting to see from him. I think rivals has him as the number 13 receiver. Um, I'm not, I haven't seen everyone live. I haven't, but like Brian Hartline took a commitment from him in November of his sophomore year, of his junior, of his sophomore, of his junior season. Like he's pretty good. Um, if you look at a guy like DeCorey and Moore and Jamie French and Taylor Taylor out of Illinois, um, and then go down the list to like Dalen McCutcheon in Texas and Khalid Lockett in Texas, Quincy Porter in New Jersey, Philip Bell in California, like there's a guys that, to pick from you know sean terry who's from ironton ohio probably the best receiver in the state of ohio he's committed to notre dame already so you know the buckeyes were interested there and would have liked to have gotten him on campus but he didn't want to come to campus without an offer and they wanted to make sure that he came to campus so they could meet him before they really offered and anyway he's at notre dame but there are going to be some opportunities for ohio state to make some some moves at wide receiver in these next few months and if decorian moore decides to visit columbus 
whether it's in the spring or early summer, like watch out. That's all I'm saying. Like just pay attention, pay attention to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. We'll, yeah. Be, we'll be watching that. So that, that Philip bell kid, California, that was the name, right? We talked about him a little bit before the show. Yeah. Like down, maybe, maybe a little bit, a little bit down the board a little bit. Would you agree with that? I mean, I, I think the problem that you have, if you're Philip bell at six foot, is that there's guys like DeCorey and Moore out there that exist at six foot. And if, but he's really good. Uh, it's one of those, like the return on investment. It, Philip Bell's very interested in Ohio State. The Buckeyes are very interested in him. But long term prognosis, do, it, does it seem likely to land him from California or does, is it easier to go get Taylor Taylor in Illinois, who's closer to, to Ohio? Like, and they're similar players. So I, I think that there's those are the conversations that Ohio State has to have. Philip Bell is certainly in that group of that seven or eight wide receivers nationally that are worth knowing and paying attention to right now for Ohio State, I would contend. So let's move on. Let's wrap this up. We'll go to the four minute offense, Andrew. This is obviously a lot of things going on recruiting wise nationally. As I said at the start of the show, the NCAA injunction. Um, you know, from the courts in Tennessee, telling people that basically you can break the rules. There are no rules. Who cares? Um, there are still apparently rules, as Trey McNutt has found out, who, you know, Shaker Heights, safety, number one ranked defensive back in Ohio, number one ranked defensive player in Ohio, I think in the class of 2025 and as a, on a consensus basis. Um, well, him and Justin Hill are back and forth, but who went and played seven on seven for fast Houston uh in january and is now suspended for the first couple of games of the year for shaker heights and it, it's going to open up some weird conversation because i think there's at least a small chance whether it's img or whether it's moving to tennessee where his father richard mcnutt is an assistant for eddie george's tennessee state tigers like i wouldn't be shocked if this led to trey mcnutt playing his senior year somewhere other than shaker heights ohio which could potentially have a negative side effect for ohio state yeah, I mean, first of all, that rule is just absurd to begin with. Like, I can't believe that we're sitting in a world where he's getting suspended for that. But that's, I guess, a different argument. Um, I don't know. Maybe they I don't know if there's like an appeal process or something like that. He can he can do to just not have to miss those games or what um, if he do, if he were to go down to like an IMG or something, that's going to make some people worry about the the status of his recruitment and Ohio State's chances. I hadn't heard much about Tennessee, but now that you mentioned that, um, I guess that would make sense too. Do you get the feeling that I know we're thinking ahead? Like if he were to relocate somewhere like that, do you think that's just a terrible sign or just something Ohio State's gonna have to fight through? Or what are your thoughts? I think it's just something you have to deal with and fight through. I don't think it's a bad news situation. I, I would like in the terms of Dorian Brew's move to Texas is bad news. Like, and it probably uh, becomes a hurdle in the recruitment for Ohio State that you have to pay close attention to. I would say with Trey McNutt, it's more like a speed bump that you're like, ah, dang it, that's annoying. Kind of stub the toe it means you're spending a little bit more money to go see him than you did when he was an hour and 45 minutes up the road. So, um, obviously, this is a kid who's an Ohio State legacy. The Buckeyes are making him a priority. There's a lot of all those moving parts, but he is, he's a different type of kid. I, I recommend going to Trey's um, YouTube channel. He's got a pretty active one. He does a nice job making his own videos and his blogs. And uh, he, he gives his aside to this whole suspension. I agree with you. It's stupid. It's a dumb rule. It shouldn't exist. The OSHA has continually put Ohio state's uh, Ohio's the state of Ohio's prep players at a significant disadvantage nationally and i don't know why they continue to do it with a lot not allowing them to do seven on seven until after may 1st not allowing them to do uh spring football in ohio we've talked about that before i don't want you to go down that road but it, it is it is bad for the players in ohio i believe fully and i'm certainly not a lawyer i'm just a caveman but uh, if trey mcnutt took osha to court about this i think he would win like, I don't understand how basketball players are allowed to play AAU nine months out of the year and do all the things they're allowed to do, and hockey players are, and baseball players are, but football players aren't. That makes zero sense, and he would probably win that in court if he decided that he, it was worth the fight. Um, but either way, from a recruiting standpoint, it just means that it's it's just a nuisance for Ohio State that you may have to deal with if he ends up traveling somewhere else. 
um, and playing somewhere else. So, you know, it is, it, it is just one of those things that you have to now accept in the year 2024 that players are going to find ways to do things to make themselves better, but also to increase their exposure and grow their brand. And that's what seven on seven is nationally. And there's no, no explanation, no reasonable excuse for Ohio's best players to not to be able to do that period. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you hundred percent on that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Other than that, I guess just month of March wise, if we were to kind of put a number, just kind of early throw a number out there as far as like an over under, I know people love the over under, um, on, on commitments. Like I'd probably put the number at like 1.5 or something right now, which is very low and kind of sounds kind of weird just given all the activity that's going on. Would that yeah. kind of be around where, around where you'd put it to? Uh, I, I would. I probably, I mean, again, I think you get the opportunity here for like a Nolan Davenport, something like that to, to pop. Um, you, you don't know, like Cody Haddad at St. Ignatius, the, you know, the safety prospect who's committed to Wisconsin, he's playing it super close to the vest and is not wanting to talk about the Ohio state offer or any of that sort of stuff because he is committed to Luke fickle. If he decided to like visit in March or April, I could see him, and this is just complete conjecture on my part. Again, I have not spoken to him about this because he doesn't want to talk about this stuff. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if it was like a private quick visit and then an instant flip to because it's better. To, he's not someone who's going to play this process out like that. But if he has any interest in Ohio State, I think he'd like to come and see the school. Um, so I think you know that you could maybe see something like that. Kainoa Winston, a uh, safety out of uh, Washington D.C. area, Gonzaga High School. Like, I think he's a guy that maybe could see an opportunity to like leapfrog some people if he was if he wants to be at Ohio State. He's going to visit in March, and knowing that Fahim Delane's out there and taking his time, knowing that Trey McNutt is taking his time. It'd be interesting to me if Kainoa Winston uh, did something along those lines where he put himself really into that conversation. Uh, and he's nationally, according to the 247 composite, he's the ninth ranked safety in the country. 247 has him as the number two safety in the country overall. Um, I think on three has him as, uh, let me see, I'm going to pull that up. Sorry. Um, like rivals is the outlier for sure on his recruitment. So right. on three has him as the number seven safety two, four, seven has him as the number two safety ESPN has him as the number four ranked safety and rivals has him as the number 33rd ranked safety. So like there's a significant drop, um, but he's a player that Ohio state is very interested in. And, and Matt Guerrero has been um, put, putting a lot of time and effort into in the last six months or six weeks. So, um, there is like a player like that, I think randomly who could pop up and, and sh surprise you, but I'd probably say two and a half if we're talking by the spring game. But as I mentioned, like I, that's almost intentional for Ohio state because this, this is the, this is the slow build. The spring build goes to the summer official visits. The, the Buckeyes will host 50 plus guys in June for officials. And that's when they want to have things wrapped up with people, not necessarily now, because in a world where kids can take as many official visits as they want, in some cases, especially for the out-of-state kids, the kids from further away from Columbus, like that that extra time to take all these trips is just it just leaves open the door for chaos, you know. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, I, yeah, I mean, other this week, other than that, this week there was only a couple other small bits of information. Mark Zachary, the the cornerback from from Indiana, who was long thought to be maybe an Ohio State lean for a while there, up until Naheem offered and, and and Sanchez and all that narrowed his list down. Seems like he's going to end up at Notre Dame. I think Cincinnati was on there. Ohio State obviously wasn't. Um, we talked about the running back stuff earlier. They offered that kid out of Mississippi. What was that? A Kylan Deer? Is that the name? Is that correct? Yeah, I mean it's he's a really good player. He's a top seventy player in the country. Interestingly enough, I was told that uh, uh, Kylan has been reaching out to Ohio State, not the other way around. It wasn't the Buckeyes who initiated the contact. Um, and so, when a kid like that, who's a top seventy player in the nation, top six or seven ranked running back, wants to get to know you, you have to say yes. The Buckeyes have not signed a player from Mississippi since nineteen ninety one. Um, or 1990, I think. So, like, it's obviously a rare opportunity, but he's looking at schools all over the country. 
And this is one of those situations, Andrew, where even though Quinshaw Judkins is from Alabama and not Mississippi, he played at Mississippi. And I think maybe like you see it that, that antenna start to go up and oh well this kid who i was idolizing watching in college is now playing there so we'll see if he visits this month but I, that's an interesting one for ohio state and i'm of the mindset right now that the more national players you get into the conversation like a kylan deer like jordan davison who's obviously very serious about ohio state like uh byron lewis uh the more guys you have nationally to put a little bit of pressure on marquise davis is probably a good thing um so you know, I, I think that you should be interested and happy that he's got it, um, you know, now an Ohio State offer and he's talking about wanting to come up and visit. So we'll see if he does. Yeah. I, 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 think, I You know, what do you do? You know, if you're Ohio State, like Naeem Offered wants to commit, you can't say no because you're afraid of what it'll do for the recruitment of Mark Zachary, who's Ohio State's very high on. But what do you do there? Right. Yeah, I get it. And, you know, Dorian Brew is still out there and they've got all kinds of things going on with uh, with cornerback. But with uh, a Kylan Deer, like the last Mississippi running back recruitment, I remember was the Cam Akers one. And Mm -hmm. he was like one of my favorite players they recruited over the last like 10 years. That one kind of broke my heart. Um, Anything else? I guess just this month, we talked a lot about the 2025 guys. Is there anything to watch for? 2026 like anything big on your radar i know we've got some quarterback stuff not really happening but guys that are on a radar that were maybe leaning toward ohio state now not leaning toward ohio state just anything going on there we need to watch out for i honestly think that you know we're talking about nolan davenport and the offensive line in the class of 2025 in ohio but adam guthrie um who does not have an offer from ohio state who's in the class of 2026 he's six foot six 270 pound offensive lineman like really good there's already three players in the state of ohio in on the offensive line that have a buckeye offer will conroy sam greer and max riley if you add guthrie to that list by the end of spring i i think ohio state in the class of 2026 could sign four offensive linemen all from ohio and i think it would be an absolute grand slam class but i I would not be surprised if you saw a like a push toward that happening On the January Junior Day visit weekend that the Buckeyes had, they had Greer there, they had Riley there, they had Conroy there. Um, And I I think that there's an opportunity there to make some some hay. Um, Around the state, like I I guess Albert Bell, um, Albert Hill, sorry, not Albert, Albert Bell, Albert Hill (laughs) from uh, uh, Akron Hoban, the cornerback is a top priority uh, there. I, I would like to see Toledo Central Catholic Uh, corner Vic Singleton get back to Columbus he's going to be really really good and uh, I started talking about him a year ago when I saw him at a at a workout at Central and he's starting to move up starting to pick up offers and and power five offers so I I think that there's a lot the class of 2026 in Ohio might be one of the best in quite some time nationally though I think the question is does Brady Smigel who they offered the quarterback from Newport California uh Newberry California sorry does he get to campus and is there still like a chance for things happening um, with Tennessee quarterback Jared Curtis, who, like, I don't, <laughs> Ohio State, if, if you look at what's happened in the quarterback room in the last six weeks, it's very understandable. And we talked about this on last week's show, but I, I don't want to rehash it too much. But you lose Corey Dennis, uh, Bill O'Brien comes in, he leaves, Chip Kelly comes in, and now Todd Fitch leaves to go to LSU. Um, so the entire quarterback room has been chucked around. I don't know what they're going to do as far as an analyst or a position assistant at quarterback at this point. I, I don't. I, I don't know. Um, is there? Uh, I almost feel like the decision was made to try to bring in other position assistants, and but uh, Todd Fitch has been pretty valuable for Ohio State, and I think you could find a way to. to replace him with with a good coach and somebody who can be equally valuable but um if you're jared curtis if you're smigel if you're any of these kids nationally you can understand taking a step back and saying let me see what stabilizes there and and you wait till the summer yeah that sounds about right hey i know this is a four minute and we're at like 10 minutes of this already but i wanted to ask you this earlier um switching back to 2025 though for a bit in state so we haven't talked a lot about luca gilbert recently at all and he's got one future cast in for Ohio State, which was done almost exactly a year ago by you. Yeah. Do you think that as just a fan watching this stuff go down, do you think that's a name that can kind of be 
taken off of the radar right now and maybe put back on the radar if something happens with Roberts or Brock shot, or what are your vibes on that right now? The, the question for Luca Gilbert is simple. Are you aware and willing aware of the fact that everyone who is looking at you right now is super impressed by your size and athleticism and, and saying to themselves, well, that's pretty intriguing for a tight end. But in the back of their mind, they're going, that could be really, really special at tackle. And I I don't know exactly how far down that road Luca Gilbert is in his mind of saying, maybe I need to a lot. He's like six foot eight and 255 yeah, yeah. pounds. Like he's gonna be a I really think he can be an elite tackle down the road. And so is he willing to accept that? That I think is a conversation a lot of coaches are having with him. Um, Ohio State, as you mentioned, there's Nate Roberts, there's Brock Schott from Leo, Indiana, the Fort Wayne area, who's at the top of the list when it comes to who the Buckeyes are looking for at tight end right now in the class of 2025. But Gilbert is an athlete that I think you would love to get him into camp in, Ju in June and say, we're going to let you come in and camp. We'll run you around at tight end. But then when camp's over, you know what we'd love to do, Luca? is just pull you inside with Coach Fry for 25 minutes and see what this looks like. Because I do think that's where his future is going to be. I don't know if he thinks that or not. So that will probably depend. That will probably dictate where his career arc goes, uh, is how willing he is to look into that future. Yeah, I'd yeah. forgotten all about him. Yeah, because definitely. Yeah, I've forgotten all about him because we rarely talk about him, but I would be kind of intrigued if they would allow him to come to Columbus and maybe go that Reed Fraggle route, you know, bring him in as like a 6'7", 6'8", 250, 260 tight end, and then ultimately convert him over to tackle. But I don't know. Yeah, that's just a name I had seen mentioned the other day and realized, hey, we haven't talked about this one in quite some time. So, cool. I mean, uh, Reed Fraggle, you remember the recruiting story about Reed Fraggle, I'm sure. The most remarkable when, when, when Ohio State knew that they had to have him in their class of 2008, right? I don't know if I do. So I just know he, I remember he's from Michigan, but refresh my memory. He was on an, an, a, he was on a visit and they were leaving the Blackwell to go over to the stadium or to go out somewhere. I don't remember all the details, but apparently somebody tried to like rob his dad and read, like knock this dude out in the street. And that's when they were like, okay, uh, all the other players were like, we got to have this guy on our team. So he like stopped mugging, essentially. That's the wow. rumor. He doesn't deny it, by the way. We've talked about it. So I don't sorry. know if I'd ever heard that before. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. yeah. That was when you're like, oh, we want this kid. Turned out to be okay. Um, no, there, there's a lot of potential for Luca Gilbert. Um, and again, Ohio State wants to recruit inside of the state of Ohio. They want to make sure these kids don't go elsewhere. But some of this is incumbent on the kid themselves to say, where's my best future going to be? And it is really hard to look at Luca Gilbert and not get enamored with the idea that he could be a special offensive line. So now that's the question though, when you have Nolan Davenport's of the world, like you're going to take one of these developmental tackles, the faster, the sooner that Luca Gilbert makes that decision internally to t go all into that route, the easier it becomes to have that conversation. So, you know, does he wait himself out? I don't know. Lots, lots to figure out. So there's a lot going on. We're going to be talking stuff about it here on the podcast um, all the time. As I said, planning Sundays for talking stuff throughout spring football at Ohio State. Um, in the event that something pops up during the week, we'll try to do our best to um, you know, throw a, a random episode in here or there when necessary. But at this joint, let's go 7 p.m. Sundays. That's the goal. Um, for Andrew Ellis, I'm Jeremy Birmingham. That is the end of this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time.